All right, well, let's get started. My name's Randy Wong. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for our February 2019 webinar on the treatment of floaters. Tonight, what I'd like to talk about are the different causes of floaters. There are just a few. There's just a few slides that you have to hear me talk about. And then we'll open up the floor for uh, questions and answers. I'm a retina specialist located in Fairfax, Virginia, in the United States, uh, which is about 20 minutes from Washington, D.C. I have two websites, which you may follow me through. It's either vitrectomyforfloaters.com or retinaeyedoctor.com. This webinar is for informational purposes only. This webinar does not offer medical advice, so nothing should be construed as medical advice. The information on this webinar is only offered for informational purposes. You should not act or rely on anything in this webinar or use it as a substitute for medical advice from a licensed professional. The content of this webinar may quickly become outdated, especially due to the nature of the topics covered, which are constantly evolving. The materials and the information on this webinar are not guaranteed to be correct, complete, or timely. Nothing in this webinar and nothing you, do, you or I do creates a doctor-patient relationship between you and the webinar, between you and me, or between you and Randall Wong, MD, or retinaeyedoctor.com, or vitrectomyforfloaters.com. Even if you try to contact me through this posting of the webinar or conversations through the webinar, you are not creating a doctor-patient relationship. Although I am a doctor, I am not your doctor until and unless there is a written agreement specifically providing for a doctor-patient relationship. So having said that, I'd like to go over just uh, what we call the differential in medicine, which is other causes of floaters, or if you talk about floaters, what are all the what are all the causes of floaters? Uh, the most common is posterior vitreous detachment. Second is probably blood in the middle of the eye or a vitreous hemorrhage. And we'll talk about the different causes of a vitreous hemorrhage. Inflammation can cause floaters. Also can a benign condition called asteroid hyalosis. Remember what we're talking about are floaters. We're talking about anything that is suspended within the vitreous. And that's why you have the characteristic um, moving to and fro uh, of the floaters when you move your eyes back and forth, up or down. Let's talk about a PVD. PVD stands for posterior vitreous detachment. Very common, you get a Weiss ring, which is a which is a visible um, round circle of where the vitreous was attached to the optic nerve. A PVD naturally causes it occurs in everybody, but usually PVDs start to uh, occur around age 40, 50, 60. By the time you're 80 years old, chance of you having a PVD in each eye is about 100 percent. Now the floaters in a PVD cast shadows on, on your retina, and that's why they're so annoying. That's why they're usually black or shades of gray. My thought is that the protein structure of the vitreous changes in certain people, and the optical density changes so that the ability to cast shadows is either better or worse, however you want to look at it. Now, shadows can also be caused by blood, or blood from a retinal tear. So it's just not really a, a PVD. A PVD can have optical qualities, I think, that cause floaters. But more importantly, PVDs can cause a, a tear, which can liberate either uh, cells from underneath the retina into the vitreous or blood if it tears through a retinal vessel. So blood in the vitreous is called a vitreous hemorrhage. And a vitreous hemorrhage, as you can see on the slide on the right, uh, can be caused by retinal disease such as diabetic retinopathy or retinal vascular occlusions. Uh, something like a branch retinal vein occlusion or a central vet, uh, retinal vein occlusion. These are common types of vascular occlusions that could lead to bleeding into the vitreous. 
A retinal tear can cause a vitreous hemorrhage if the tear tears across or if the tear involves a retinal blood vessel of the <clears throat> and enough blood is liberated so that you can see it. A PVD can often cause a vitreous hemorrhage where you don't actually see the tear and that's why I said that's a subclinical tear meaning you can't see it. Now I don't have a great picture of inflammation in the retina but there are certain uh, diseases or infections uh, which involve retinal inflammation such as toxoplasmosis there are some other ocular infections sarcoidosis is a um, a what would you what would I say an endogenous type of inflammation uh, within the body uh, as is uveitis these are different types of uh, inflammation from the body toxoplasmosis is an infection there are other infections sarcoidosis and uveitis are, are what we call endogenous types of uh, inflammation uh, what is inflammation well if you think about patients that have arthritis of the knee or of a finger joint those are types of inflammation in a closed space now I saw this picture from one of my videos. Asteroid hyalosis is a common finding where these white powdery flecks are absolute or actually invisible to most of the patients that have them. At times they can become so dense that patients actually complain of floaters. It, it is possible that these uh, yellow whitish floaters in the vitreous are there and then when you get a PVD the concentration of these um, asteroid bodies increases and then it starts to be decrease the vision and patients complain of floaters okay it's Q&A um, don't worry about the part that says December 4th 2018 I forgot to change that all right I'm gonna open up the floor to questions we've got about another 20 minutes for questions I'm going to go to Lars' first question, which was, is there a laser that can catch the floaters that are far up or down in my eye? Or is it only possible to get the ones that are in the center of the eye? Uh, I think what you're really asking is, you know, you can only laser the floaters that you can see. So that floaters way up or way down or way left or right, way right may not be uh, amenable to laser. On the other hand, if they're that far off to the side, they may not actually be obstructing your vision. It's hard to know. I have to say that I don't use the uh, YAG laser for floaters. I don't know of a retina specialist that does. Lars asks again, is every, if everyone at age 80 has a PVD, why do so many people at that age don't get a vitrectomy or some other treatment for the PVD? Wouldn't their eyes be completely filled with floaters after a PVD? That's a good question. Not everybody uh, experiences floaters with a PVD. And not everybody with floaters is bothered to the same degree. I think that's a pretty reasonable question. But I, I and the explanation is, you know, we all have different tolerances to whatever ails us. So I'm thinking that people, there are a lot of people out there with floaters that just put up with them. Rick says, does vitrectomy carry more risk of retinal detachment than cataract surgery? Especially for high myopes, does FOV increase the long-term risk of retinal detachment post-surgery? Have there any have there been any longitudinal studies of this? Uh, that these are great questions. Uh, have there been any longitudinal studies of this? I'm not aware that there have been any longitudinal uh, double-blind studies. Um, I'm not really avoiding a question. I'm not so sure that there are any great studies complaining, comparing the same type of vitrectomy in high myopes versus non myopes or, or not so high myopes. Uh, does FOV increase the long term risk of retinal detachment post surgery? I would argue that FOV decreases the chance of uh, retinal detachment because you're really debulking, there's less vitreous, if you will. Um, and less inertia to pull on the retina and cause a tear. Mark says, my left eye has a PVD. Diagnosis having a detached hyaloid membrane 
much bigger than a Weiss ring. It was unsuccessfully treated by YAG. How can I be certain it's a detached membrane? Well, I think you need to have, be examined, but it sounds like is that, though that the entire posterior half or portion of your vitreous is uh, causing hazy vision, and that's what's moving in front of your your eye. So I, I think the answer is it sounds as though that's the case, uh, but you probably should confirm it by getting an exam. Lars says, so what would a complete PVD look like in people if it did not lead to any floaters at all in their case? Would they have the same vision as before PVD? What changes? Uh, no, my point is that you can see patients w who have a PVD and floaters, they're just not bothered. They're just, they're just not moving towards they need to have a vitrectomy. They're okay with it. The most, and that's why I'm guessing <clears throat> that's uh, you've, you know, many of my patients have been told prior to me seeing them, like, you need to live with your floaters. And again, it comes down to tolerance and, and thresholds, you know, at what point are you willing to put up with these, these floaters, etc. Steve says, Doc, uh, doctor, what is the risk assessment for you in inducing a PVD in surgery if a patient has floaters but not has but has not had a PVD. I think the chance of retinal tear increases, and I'm I'm guessing this is uh, probably up to. It probably increases to about two percent. Um, it's been my experience that any tears caused when you induce a PVD, we're able to see them during the operation. If we're able to see them, we can treat them, and so the chance of retinal tear, uh, retinal detachment drop significantly so that's but I still think that it's it's got to increase statistically so that's why I double it to two percent do you perform mark says do you perform FOV with induced PVD or just a core FOV uh, if you've been following me for a while I did used to do core FOVs I do not like to do core FOVs in young patients mainly because once I've uh, induced a PVD and removed more of the vitreous efficiently um, really reduces the chance of frill in young people. Lars, I don't know what the recommended age for an FOV is. You actually, you know, you, if you're, if you're younger than 18 in the United States, you have to come with your parents. That has happened before. Um, I think that if you've had them, if you've been plagued with floaters for months to years, I think it's a topic of conversation. Rick says, what holds the retina in place when the vitreous is gone? Well, the vitreous doesn't keep the, the retina in place, period. Uh, think of the retina being glued to the wall of the eye, and underneath the retina is a, I don't want to say there's glue, there is a potential space, um, and there is negative pressure, if you will. Um, the retina naturally wants to cling to the side of the wall. Um, if a tear occurs, which equalizes the pressure between the, on one side of the retina to underneath the retina, then the retina can detach. Lars says, so everybody with a PVD has some floaters. No, I think, I, you know, Lars, I don't know why we're going this. What, all I'm saying is, Everyone has a PVD. Not all patients with a PVD have floaters. And of those, few few of the older people that have PVDs with floaters consider having a vitrectomy. Rick says, I have PVDs in both eyes. What has filled the void where the vitreous has pulled away? Well, think of the vitreous as a mixture of water and protein. Think of the vitreous as jellyfish. And in the areas where the jellyfish or the vitreous has moved or separated from the retina, the pockets or the void is just filled with your natural saline solution, which is what we call aqueous humor. Zoeb says, I have, I had vitrectomy, uh, but, but now it is three months now. My site is 2020, but I see edges on some, on on the side, some just come in front when I try to focus on something and I'm having some flashing lights in my peripheral in the dark. I got it checked out by a doc, that's a good idea, and he's saying the retina is fine, no tears, but they don't know why I'm seeing these. Flashes, what would you say if I got a second vitrectomy, it will clear the residual vitreous. 
I think it's quite possible that, uh, keep in mind that if you have a vitrectomy, you're changing the uh, vector forces of some of the fluids that are moving in the retina. Keep in mind also that we're not removing all of the vitreous so that as your eye moves, some of the vitreous, although it, it although the strands of the vitreous are, are shorter, um, you still have some fluid dynamics which, which which play on the retina, and they can tug on the retina and cause flashes. Uh, it's been our experience that a second vitrectomy generally improves. Uh, it sounds like to me you're suffering from frill. Uh, this could help significantly. Mark says, my right eye has a cataract and many floaters through senioresis, no PVD yet. Can you do an FOV and a cataract operation with IO implant at the same time? Uh, in theory, you can do that. In practice, it's very difficult. Uh, generally, uh, most retina uh, surgeons do not perform cataract surgery. Uh, and many, I don't know many, but at least in our locale, um, there are not too many operating rooms which are able to do both retina and cataract surgery. Generally, it is uh, reserved for two different operations, one for the vitrectomy, second for cataracts. And if, and if that's the case, if you're my patient, I'd say, hey, get the cataract done, see if that's, if you're still having issues, let's consider the vitrectomy at a later time. Lars said, did the person who under the age of 18 have a PVD prior to just floaters? No. And how did the vitrectomy well, we've had several. Uh, they, they've gone very well. Um, I, I haven't seen many of them for a long time once they go home. Bob says, living in the UK, it's very difficult to convince a doctor to perform a vitrectomy. And after several visits and pleading with them, they keep telling me it's too dangerous. What would be your advice on how to conduct myself explaining this very my situation? I think you've got a tough road. I mean, in the United States, most doctors advise against this. Uh, the reason you're listening tonight is because I'm one of the few that is trying to be as objective as possible. The numbers speak for itself. And this is what you might tell uh, your doctors is the chance of uh, endophthalmitis, that's the infection inside the eye, is lower in vitrectomy than it is in cataract. But cataract surgery is done all the time chance of a retinal detachment following cataract surgery is probably somewhere about 1%. That's the same as, as vitrectomy. So you're not really, it's, it's really not fair that they have this argument that they just, that it, it's dangerous because I think the statistics and, this, and the numbers I just gave you, they're not mine. Um, these are what I understand to be national statistics, at least in the United States. Mark says, I'm 57, extremely myopic, have had cataract surgery in Iowa in my right eye, also an earlier core vitrectomy in right eye, my right eye. Well, you'd be an excellent candidate. Um, cataract formation is, you know, just happens once, you've already got the implant, and with the natural lens out of the way, then you, it would be very easy for a vit vitrectomy to be performed, and obviously there's no chance of causing a cataract. Having a PVD makes it, in my opinion, very easy. Lars says, sorry, now you confused me. You switched between saying everybody with a PVD has floaters, but many don't care, and saying that not everybody with PVD has floaters. You know, I'm, I'm Lars, I, I don't mean to confuse you at all, and I think you're taking me too literally, and if I misspoke, I apologize. PVDs often cause floaters, but they don't always. And it... By the time we're 80 years old, chances of you having a PVD is about 100%. But that doesn't mean you're going to have floaters. And if you do, it doesn't mean that you're you're going to be, you need to have them removed. Rick, in trying to dissuade me from FOV, my local retinal specialist claimed to have just recently seen a patient who had a POV 10 years earlier in both eyes and is now experiencing retinal detachment in both eyes. Does that sound plausible? Yes, it's plausible. It's unlikely, in my opinion, or in my experience. Um, I think having had a vitrectomy, once you get over the post-op period, actually makes you, actually decreases the chance of getting a retinal tear, which is called retinal detachment. Uh, maybe there was something going on. I, I don't know. It just, I, I'm not so sure I agree, or that I would, 
I would reach the same conclusions given the information you just gave me. Mark says, uh, how can one persuade insurance to cover FOV in the USA? Uh, I don't think you need to. Um, in, and this is something Chrissy may, you may be able to email Chrissy at rwongcm13 at gmail. Um, I don't pay attention to the insurance that much at all. Um, so I, I think it's been my experience that everything's covered. Cynthia says, uh, facility fees are prohibitive for self-pay. I have Kaiser. Would you consider doing both eyes at one time? Um, Cynthia, with regard to economics, I'm sympathetic, but there is no way I would do both eyes at the same time. There have been cases in history where two eyes were done with either the same, you know, artificial saline, which was contaminated, or bilateral cataract surgery was done with the same lot or with the same implants from the same batch and they were contaminated there's just it's just there's no way i would do it um i am hopeful that w i just got uh privileges at a new hospital i'm hoping that uh their self what we call self-pay patient rate is different Sorry for all the uh, dings, getting texted from the family. Um, Lars says, got it, thanks for clearing it up. Do you know about really good surgeons doing vitrectomy in Germany? I don't, I don't know many international colleagues. I barely know, you know, my colleagues in the United States. Uh, if I wanna get it done here, if I decide to get a vitrectomy, I, I, I wish I could help you, I just don't. Mark said, I mistyped. My left eye is an IOL, PVD, and a detached hyaloid membrane. Your left eye would be the easiest for me. Uh, Rick says, does hemoglobin increase the risk of FOV, retinal detached from 1% to 10%? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know where you get the 10%. That's awfully high. That's really high. Um, oh, sorry. This is also told me my local retina specialist. Uh, I will go on record by saying I don't agree. Lars says, are there new treatments up the horizon or will vitrectomy always be the gold standard? I think for now, in our lifetime, vitrectomy is going to be the gold standard. I don't see that there's going to be anything in the horizon. <clears throat> Most research money, at least in the United States, are uh, going towards um, better therapies for uh, bigger problems, if you will. Uh, uh, diseases such as uh, retinitis pigmentosa, RPE, trans um, sorry, um, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, stem cell um, transplantation, etc. So I don't think that vitrectomy is going to change that much uh, more in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. It's changed a lot in the last 15. So much so that I think technology, in my opinion, has made this so much safer that we can actually talk about it tonight. Bob says, do I have an opinion about the uses of electronic cigarettes causing floaters? Uh, no opinion whatsoever. I have no idea how that would happen. I've used mine excessively over the years. causes me extremely dry and aching eyes. I wonder if there's a correlation there. Um, I can't think of one. Do I have any experience of patients using electronic cigarettes? I have no idea. It's not part, I never ask about electronic cigarettes because I Maybe I, I should think about it and see if there's a correlation. I just never thought there was an association. <clears throat> Mark, I think you asked me this question over email about doctors doing FOV in the office. And my response is that it is not standard of care. There are some uh, systems where you could do a vitrectomy in the office, but I think it's very limited in scope. And I can't possibly see without a great microscope how you could get off to as a good as good an operation uh, compared to the operating room. Rick says I have a PVD in both eyes and already had cataract surgery high myopia but based upon what I'm hearing I'm a good candidate. Yes I would answer that with yes. I'm going to end this in just a minute because um, we're creeping up against that 
half an hour. Uh, Lars says, what is the biggest risk in FOV? Cataract, probably 90%. And then what's second? Um, I don't think cataract is, is as high as 90%. Uh, I don't know where you got that number. And wherever you got that number, you should ask them. Um, cataract surgery, cataract after FOV is, in my experience, and I'm not going to get into this without getting deluged with a ton of emails, it just doesn't really happen. Um, we don't know why cataract forms may or may not form after vitrectomy. I know that vitrectomy for retinal detachment or in other um, situations such as macular hole where you might put gas in that, I think that can increase cataract formation. But in a straight vitrectomy that is done efficiently, you know, we just don't know what causes it. So for you to say it's going to be 90%, I think that's that's nothing but conjecture. Then you ask, do you think vitrectomy can get a bit safer in the next year's smaller needles? There are smaller needles. I think we have come so far forward that I think there's not going to be much effort to, to um, make this any safer. I'm not saying that it, it can be made any safer. It's just that it's much safer than most of your doctors tell you. And if you look at terms of infection rate compared to cataract surgery, if you look at retinal detachment rate compared to cataract surgery, which is the most common surgery in the world, you know, it's pretty hard to say that this is a more dangerous surgery. You have to also remember that when we're working, when retina specialists are performing a vitrectomy, they're doing it for a lot of reasons, including sight-threatening diseases, which is not true in cataract surgery. So there's a lot of stuff out there that you need to filter through to really make some sense of this. Um, Chrissy, um, and I think this is going to be our last comment, Chrissy wants to remind everybody um, that a lot of the commercial insurance plans do cover FOV, including Medicare. And she asks that if you have questions, please email her directly with questions on things such as insurance scheduling and the overall process. Remember, her, her email is rwongcm13 at gmail.com. Rick says, thanks for your time tonight. Much appreciated. You're welcome, Rick. Thanks, for everybody, for coming. Steve says, thank you, Dr. Wong. Lars says, thank you. Lars, you're welcome. Um, Chrissy wants to say thank you for to everyone for coming, and Cynthia, Cynthia says thanks. Uh, I really appreciate everyone um, taking their time to, to visit. Uh, this is a great thing. We're going to do it again. Zohab, you're, you're, you're welcome. Uh, we'll see you again in about two months. It's February. Look, look for us on Facebook or on the website. We'll probably have another one in uh, April. Have a, uh, everyone have a safe evening. Thanks again for joining. Best of luck to everyone. Good night.